They're known for building autobahn burners, hot-rodding Mercedes, and handcrafting incredible engines. AMG. Three letters that define high performance for the oldest car company in the world. Yeah, this is the, it is yeah, the best the and best most expensive from Mercedes Benz. Mercedes Benz. You get to come here every morning and build the best car. car. Now, Mercedes' fastest division is stepping out on its own, building just their second machine from the ground up. AMG has to prove that it has the capability of building cars that compete with supercars. To be the best, they have to beat the best. The AMG GT is 100% clearly targeted at the Porsche 911. Knocking off the reigning sports car champ comes down to a single machine. When you're doing a halo car, it has to be perfect. A can't-miss project called the Mercedes AMG GT. Deep in southwestern Germany stands the largest Mercedes-Benz facility in the world. Welcome to Sindelfing. It's a romantic factory. It's a historic factory. We just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the plant itself. The facility opens in 1916 to build aeroplanes. Three years later, they start producing cars. Nearly a century later, they've built over 20 million machines. There is nothing small about Sindelfingen. Today, the site covers more than 500,000 square meters. That's roughly the size of Vatican City. At Sindelfingen, they not only build cars, but also design and engineer them. The company's main R&D center is located here. And Sindelfingen is special compared to other plants because you have head of development, the design center is on this plant site. It's part factory and part suburban city. Every day, over 37,000 craftspeople call this place home. Uh, we are the only one who work at this car, so it's, uh, it's very special to work here. Each year, they crank out nearly 400 thousand machines, including the C, E and S-Class models. When you're there and you can help build it, it does make you proud. And you tell your circle of friends, look, we make that car. I am part of it. But hidden on the second floor of building 3 slash 10 is a handcrafted oasis. Our focus is the car, assembling the car. Efficiency is not number one. This is where they build the Mercedes AMG GT. The newest sports car from the most famous three-pointed star in the automotive world. When Mercedes makes a sports car, they take it seriously. And that's what the AMG division of the company exists for. The AMG GT is a lighter, faster, and smaller Mercedes supercar designed to beat the venerable Porsche 911. Bringing it to life requires a uniquely dedicated team of craftspeople. Working on small production series is very different than large production. It's handmade, handcrafted. Building a Mercedes by hand isn't just an occupation. Often, it's a family obsession. My grandpa was working at the shop, and my uncle was working at uh, E-Class, and I worked here. I'm proud to work here, as my father has, and I like it at Mercedes. Pride goes back a long way. Mercedes stands for cars because we invented the car. 
1885, German inventor Karl Benz has an idea. He bolts a small engine onto a three-wheeled wagon. The result is the world's first car. The vehicle revolutionizes humanity, and his company lays the foundation for Mercedes-Benz. Today, it's a global behemoth that builds more than one million new cars per year. Each one instilling a sense of passion in the next generation. My son, as soon as my three-year-old son autobahn sees the star when we're driving on the highway, Papa, dein Auto. Dad, your car. When I see a Mercedes on the street, then I know that I was done it too. One feels proud that one works for such a company. On a mass production assembly line, workers often have just a minute or two to do one task. Craftspeople on the GT line are asked to carry out multiple assignments per cycle and have far more time. The intricacy adds another layer of attraction. I have heard that the AMG GT is coming. It would be a challenge for me because one has to work on many things at one time. Complexity on the line underscores the team's competitive nature. I think that this month, or this car in particular, offers a challenge to the competition. That competition lies just 30 kilometers across town. We should be proud that the GT stands up to the Porsche, because it's a competitor of Porsche, and the GT is an amazing car in my mind. Beautiful car. The oldest car company in the world is now taking the sports car fight directly to Porsche's doorstep. You think about them like two boxers. One is methodical. The AMG is that brawler, just gets inside and just starts digging at the body and just hits as hard as it can. For years, the hard-hitting AMG philosophy is to hammer the horsepower. One of the most prolific AMGs was nicknamed the Hammer, if that gives you an idea about what their development philosophy is like. But in an ultra-competitive automotive environment, high horsepower alone is no longer enough. Now, AMG must take the next evolutionary step and build their very own machine. How they choose to do it comes down to the word of just one man. For nearly half a century, AMG has been hot-rodding Mercedes. They were about big power and going fast on the Autobahn. The quest for big power starts with a bold gamble. In 1967, two Mercedes-Benz engineers decide to strike out on their own to build race cars. The founders of the company, Mr. Alfred, Mr. Manchin, they left Mercedes and founded AMG as, as a new company. Four years later, the two founders take a hot-rodded 6.8-litre 300 SEL, affectionately nicknamed the Red Pig, and go racing at the 24 hours of Spa. AMG was born on the racetrack in 67, long, long ago. When the Red Pig crosses the finish line, it wins its class. The victory puts AMG on the path to automotive immortality and crystallizes the myth of the mighty Bavarian engine tuner. Mercedes realizes there's some potential here and starts doing some joint ventures. Eventually, Mercedes Benz said, we'll just buy these guys and we'll have our own in-house performance division. Today, that high performance division is known for building full-blown autobahn burners. And even on the factory floor, the pride is evident. I'm attaching the components to the motor. Lines, accelerator, water hoses, etc. Everything else that an engine gets. 
It's definitely more exciting to work on an engine like this. And at AMG, the challenge is also much, much, much greater. Over the years, the hard work handcrafting engines pays off. You know when you hear AMG, you're getting the one that makes all the noise and the smoke and, the, and spins tires and does all the fun stuff. The real magic of AMG is the crazy guys behind the scenes. I mean, these are real car guys. They love to be sideways, they love to go fast, they love to have fun. Real car guys that are hell-bent on proving their engineering metal in the most contested sports car space available. If you want to prove your capabilities, then you have to move into a segment which is very competitive. Their new entry is the AMG GT, a machine born to defeat just one car. It is 100% the Porsche 911. Is that a car you want to pick a fight with? I don't really know. The man starting that brawl is Tobias Moores. And it's obviously a segment which stands for sports cars. With some history from other brands who wanted to face the competition. Tobias is the head of Mercedes AMG. He is hot rodder in chief. Tobias is a salt of the earth dude who loves to get down and dirty. He's not a corporate executive who's concerned with profitability and finance, all that. So a lot of times someone in his position is really expected to really be out there, you know, shaking hands and kissing babies. And Tobias has managed to just stay a really straight to the point hot rodder who wants to make awesome cars. Moores begins working for AMG in the early 90s and quickly moves through the ranks. But at the end of the day, it's, it's your own opinion, and it's always how we would like to drive that car. It's an auto attitude that comes to define the AMG badge. I do have my specific opinion on uh, how a car should feel. You have to have a philosophy behind your car. That philosophy begins a decade earlier with a different machine, the Mercedes SLS. In the father is obviously the SLS. We started engineering work with the SLS in 2006, brought the car to market in 2010. The SLS marks the first time that AMG designs a car from the ground up. Giving them a ton of money to develop an all-new car for themselves, that's... It's a risky business proposition, and it's messing with the status quo. Until this point, every AMG is a higher performance variant of a regular Mercedes vehicle. The SLS marks the beginning of AMG standing on its own. You really start to see AMG breaking away and becoming its own core division in the SLS. It was a car designed by and for AMG. When the SLS debuts, the heady looks and gullwing doors blow people away. And the SLS was that supercar that was really expensive. It only had two seats. It had crazy doors that opened up. It looked like nothing else. It really was a, a showstopper. The 200,000 euro price tag thrusts the brand into a new financial stratosphere. When you start trying to line it up with the market, you find it doesn't really fit in against certain targets. You, you kind of wonder if some customers were like, well, do I spend this much money on the 911 Turbo or do I jump up to the SLS? Mercedes-Benz has had lots of expensive cars, but that was really pushing it, whether or not a, a Mercedes-Benz automobile could play in that atmosphere. While the SLS is a marvel, it's not a volume-selling machine. During its four-year run, they moved just over 10,000 vehicles. That's less than 1% of the brand's annual output. It took a lot of fighting to build that SLS. Once that car proved what AMG could do and proved that the business opportunity was there, then the floodgates were opening. By the time the SLS hits the market, Tobias already sets his sights on another goal defeating the 911. It's an engineering-driven company. We know what we could do better. 
We had the idea for the GT in, in mid-10, end of 10. Yeah? And the idea was, what is next? Yeah? A task that always drives us. Yeah? What is next? Then the idea came up to move into a different segment. Mercedes Benz has figured out that the, the most competitive market is just below the real crazy supercar market. Targeting their local adversary doesn't begin with pen and paper, but rather with a single engineering question. Where to put the engine? One of the rather unconventional parts of the AMG is where the, the engine sits. Tobias and his team decide to put the motor in the front of the machine. It doesn't sound unusual, but how they do it is. First of all, you have to start with some layout work. You know, it's, it's the dream of a car guy. In most traditional front engine machines, the power plant sits above the axle not behind it. This is a real true front midship engine car, which means the engine's completely behind the front axle. Placing the engine behind the front wheels centralizes the mass and puts the focus on handling. Ideal handling comes from a driving situation where you have the center of mass in the car is you know, right by the driver or slightly behind the driver. The next critical choice is the transmission. The major decision was to continue with the transaxle concept, which is great for proportions and weight balance of the car. It's part transmission and part axle. The layout's critical advantage is that it moves a large and heavy drivetrain component to the back. We have a transaxle, uh, so we have a gearbox and a rear axle. This gives us the, the, the weight distribution. Tobias Moores and his team have defined the layout of the GT, but it still needs a sexy exterior to stand out in a very crowded supercar segment. That's quite a challenge when your main competitor builds the most enduring shape in the sports car world. years of being known for hot-rodding regular Mercedes, AMG has decided to build its very own car to take on the revered Porsche 911. And our task was to go into a segment with more competition. That desire leads the team to design its second car from the ground up, the AMG GT. AMG has been around for a long time. It's only now taken on a life of its own. The team has just settled on a mechanical layout. The next question is what sort of suit it needs to wear. Gordon Wagner, the head of Mercedes-Benz design, is the man entrusted with seeing tomorrow before today. So we are living in the future. Here in our design studios, the watch is fast forward five years. Living in the future makes it a bit more easy to design the future. Wagner is the youngest person to ever lead Mercedes design. He earns the top job at 39. Yeah, basically the initiative for a new car is just between a few people. Toby approaches me and let's say, ah, let's do a successor, let's do this car different. Different is difficult when you've got over 100 years of history. It's a great chance, but of course, with all that heritage, it's a great responsibility to go beyond that. Going beyond starts by going back to the drawing board. You cannot just sit down and start doing sketches and thinking about random lines. You need to have a picture in your head. This car started actually with one designer in one sketch. One sketch and that was it. 
Then they move to an old world medium. We build it out of the clay like Michelangelo did, these sculptures of the marble. Yeah, very quickly, in the beginning of the process, we went to blocked in a, an idea. The cab sits backwards on the transmission wheel, and it has a very long hood. And this has been the proportion of Mercedes race cars ever since the 300. The 300 is the 300 SL, perhaps the most iconic Mercedes ever built. When you think about Mercedes sports cars, race cars, you think about the 300 carbon. It's... Introduced at the 1954 New York Auto Show, the 300 SL is an immediate success. But that was a moonshot. That was everything Mercedes-Benz could do, and it was a lot of work. With a top speed of 250 kilometers per hour, it is the fastest production car of its day. The car is so revered that it continues to affect the Mercedes design language. It's like this one here, for example. We call it Power Dome. It comes from the first SL300. Yeah? This is a kind of a homage to the cars that we had in the past. The first time I ever saw the AMG GT, the first thought I had was, that's what a Shelby Cobra would look like if it were designed today by a team of Germans. There is a certain appeal to having a front engine car because it gives the car a certain look. Having a super long hood, the way the greenhouse in the back sits, gives the car an appearance that you just can't get with a front engine car. I mean, it's got that curvaceousness. It really has that kind of sexy, curvy design that we don't get as often these days. Using one's imagination isn't limited to the exterior. While the design team simplifies, director of engine development, Christian Endele, dreams up a new V8. Mercedes AMG hat eine Achtzylinder DNA, eine Achtzylinder Geschichte und Achtzylinder ist einfach unser perfektes Zielaggregat, wo wir unsere gesamten Fähigkeiten reinbringen können. So there was a blank sheet of paper and also, the idea that it had to be an eight cylinder. They call the 510 horsepower engine the M178. AMG's V8 has defined what that company is. This one is a little bit different than the previous one. This is a twin turbo in-house design. Turbochargers are driven by the exhaust from the engine. And it's using that energy to force more into the engine on the other side. The Mercedes AMG does kind of a neat trick. That neat trick is to move the turbochargers from the side of the engine to the top. Mercedes calls it a hot V. Traditionally, in a V-shaped engine, the air comes in in the middle, comes in through the top, and the exhaust is on the side. If you put turbochargers in the V, you can get them making boost very quickly. The turbos spin up faster, and the whole thing fits in a supercar. Those turbos spin up to 186,000 revolutions per minute and can push 2.3 times more oxygen into the engine. But to produce 510 horsepower, the M178 has to inject fuel faster than the blink of an eye. You need to imagine that each injection takes precisely one millisecond. That's about 100 times shorter than the blink of an eye. The downside to all that high performance is heat. Suddenly you have a lot of hot stuff in between the V of the engine. That's difficult to cool. The GT's turbochargers reach an operating temperature of 800 degrees Celsius, well above the melting point of aluminium. The integration of the V8, for example, uh, with the hot inner V, was quite a challenge because we are the first company to put a complete engine approach into a sports car. And this gives us sometimes a little bit headache. Designing the engine might cause some discomfort, 
but it's the two and a half year development process that thrashes the machine. The team test the engine in one of nine advanced dyno cells. Motors are subjected to a variety of conditions, including hot and cold starts, stop and go traffic, and even pre-programmed fast laps on the Nürburgring racetrack. The first road-going prototype hits the streets in June of 2013. They take the GT to northern Sweden, South Africa, and even high up in the Rocky Mountains in the United States. Along the way, engineers cover hundreds of thousands of kilometers. Once the development process is done, it's time to build the M178. The cars from AMG tend to behave a certain way. When you stop at an accelerator, you just know something serious is happening under the hood. That serious need for speed starts in Alfaltabach, Germany, the home of AMG. We're always chasing what could be better. We always challenge the status quo. Fourteen hundred people work here every day. Yet just one person builds an engine from start to finish. One person is responsible for every last nut and bolt in that engine and putting it together. AMG stands for one man, one engine. Um, I'm one of these men and I'm very happy to do this job. Every builder signs their creation like an artist autographing a masterpiece. It makes me very proud. Every engine I complete and put my plate on it and it's every time amazing. Ja, das ist jetzt die Designabdeckung, die man hier so sieht, mit, dem, äh, mit der, der Plakette des Monteurs, mit Unterschrift, ganz wichtig, von one, one Engine. One engine. So not only do you know that your engine was built by one master technician, you can find them on Facebook. That's their reputation online, that's their name on that engine. There is a motor, you know, for, for, for AMG, one man, one engine. That guy who really assembles that engine from the beginning to the end with heart, yeah, with passion. And this is definitely different than just putting together a minivan. The factory produces 20,000 engines a year, yet looks like an artisanal workshop. It's not a mass production assembly line. It's a very efficient facility. It takes 11 steps and three hours to build an AMG V8. The build starts by swinging the block onto a special trolley. First, uh, you put the crankshaft into the crankcase. After that, you turn it, put the pistons in the crankcase. Eight very special pistons, each installed by hand. Uh, well, it's a bit difficult to put the pistons into the cylinder. I have to make sure that everything fits. Those cylinders are as unique as the pistons. Each is coated with a nano-slide treatment that makes the metal twice as hard as a conventional engine. The coating is so effective that Mercedes uses it in their Formula One cars. Next, the timing chain is added. Cylinder heads. And finally, the two turbochargers. Without liquids, the finished engine weighs just 209 kilograms. It's a great honor for me to work here. We produce performance products the whole world wants to have. I'm a little part of something big here. When you're building a high-performance sports car, every gram matters. Nowhere is that more apparent than in the GT's space frame. Aluminum space frames give us a lot of freedom regarding weight. The GT's frame comes to life in Heinsberg, Germany. And this is where we start building the body and weight of our AMG GT. 
The frame, or body and weight, weighs just 231 kilograms. Body and weight is the metallic structure that gives the car the stiffness, the rigidity, uh, the performance that you need for crash. The frame is 90% aluminium. Finding craftspeople who know how to work with the material is crucial. It's kind of hard finding people that are really true skilled laborers for aluminum cars. These people are really sought after. Steel, you bang it into shape. It stays there. If you dent it, you can pop it right back out. Aluminum welding is more difficult. It's just the more difficult material to work with. The facility is state of the art and a state unto itself. To find qualified welders, they hire from all across Europe. All the way from Portugal to Eastern Europe, uh, it's about 20 nations here on board. The key to the frame's lightweight is knowing how and where to take away material. So it's sort of patchwork quilt, right, of all these different materials, but each one is in the exact perfect place. It weighs exactly as much as it has to to get the job done. Before work begins, they have to latch the frame into the jig in precisely the right order. This prevents warping while welding. That sequence is quite critical. So otherwise you can start moving parts or shifting them. Once they're locked and loaded, it's time to weld. What you see here is the first section where we actually combine the front end of the car, the tunnel, and the rear frame of the car. There's over 100 meters of welded material in just one GT frame. The body panels go on next. So what we see here now is the framing section where it starts looking like a car. The framing jig positions the panels so that welders can ensure dimensional accuracy. See here is the station where the car finally gets its skin. Gets the fenders, the hood, the doors, anything that kind of determines the appearance of the car. At the end of the line, craftsmen give each body a final check for defects under special lights. Imperfection that we are looking for. Any scratch, any little mark. After this, the car gets protected against the environment. We put it on a truck and ship it to single thing. Finally, a new body is ready to head to the world's largest Mercedes factory, where they build the AMG GT by hand. After two and a half years of development, AMG is finally ready to build the GT. What you see here is now the uh, starting point of the production. The build starts on the second floor of building 3 slash 10 on the Sindelfingen campus. We have the high-end technology in the car, not in the system. In most factories, they start assembling a car on one side of a building and finish it on the other. But the GT line is a closed loop, and the first station is also the last station. We actually move the finished car outside the line, and we put in a new car in the line. Every 30 minutes, when a finished car comes off the line, a bare body enters it. The easiest entry point is take one third out, put another third in. The car starts here, goes upstairs, where we do preparation of the doors. The first job is building up the doors. Especially because it's a sporty car, there is not enough space inside. The door is just in the way. 
Then they take the partially built doors off and finish them next to the line. I look at cars through different eyes, mainly because I work behind the scenes and know how everything happens. The simplified approach hides a serious level of complexity. Many different configurations, and that's the challenge of that car, you know, with unique customers and they have unique wishes often. Our job is actually to fulfill those wishes. After the doors come off, the body heads downstairs to station number one, where they stamp the identification number and install the wiring harness. This is the cable harness where we start assembling a lot of cabling. The high-tech car is not easy to assemble and it has very specific parts. Craftspeople use a home-built tool to install the harness. That's a shifter knob from an old Mercedes. It fits nicely in your hand. The retrofitted shifter helps workers mount small clips that hold the harness in place. Next, they fill the car with dampening material. We have to find the right balance between sport and light. On the other hand, you want to hear the right noise, which is the engine. But not the outside. Fitting the material is a two-person job that requires precision teamwork. We have to work as a team, otherwise we don't get very far. If we all just worked individually, the car would never get built. We're attaching the fuel tank so that it sits properly on the insulation pad. After the fuel tank is installed, workers prep the engine bay for the massive V8. You have to ensure that the people have all their tools, all their parts, close to where he works. They use a mobile parts tray system, yet the key isn't the tech, but the people. When you do small volume production skit, it's important to get the right person in the right station. Up until now, the car has been steadily moving forward, but when the body changes lines, it moves backwards. Actually, you see the car is coming with the rear end first, and here we start with the first parts that the customer later will touch and feel, and that's the dashboard. The dashboard is first built up on a sub-assembly station. The dashboard is a big part. We pre-assemble it uh, on site here. The craftsperson rolls the finished dashboard to the line. Each station has a trolley that's been custom made for its craftsperson. Prepare the trolleys. They are defined by the uh, craftspeople who say this is how I want it. Workers have a large say in how the factory runs, except for one station. Now we are at the station with the only robot we have in this production line. We glue the windows and we glue the roof. Once the glass is set, they start installing cabin pieces. Customers can choose from 13 interior colors and five different kinds of trim. They install the 1000 watt stereo amplifier. Next come leather wrapped panels, and finally, the center console. The center console actually is one of the last parts. Because it's big, everything big, we do late. After that, we already start preparing for the marriage. Preparing the car for the engine starts by flipping it on its side, so workers can connect fuel and brake lines. Once the bottom is prepped, it's time to install the 510 horsepower V8. But first, they have to send the car to the altar. In German, we say oxide, where they, they bring the chassis and they couple the engine. This is technically 
the most challenging area. In this station, people really work hand in hand like we do in a pit stop, for example, in the Formula One. They build up the drivetrain subassembly using a jig. People working here need to cooperate and they really have to trust each other. It takes 10 craftspeople to put the drivetrain together. We are preparing for no related engines and gearbox. So now, bring the engine over. All this top tube. This connects the engine to the gearbox. This is the engine with the gearbox. The torque tube is a type of drive shaft that connects the engine to the rear transaxle. It looks heavy, but inside is a carbon fiber rod that weighs just 3.9 kilos. Mercedes went with a torque tube made out of carbon fiber just for light weight. If they can take a lot of mass out of that torque tube, it's less weight that the engine has to spin up every time you accelerate. Makes the car faster. This is the um, calibrated pin. I drop it there so that it will fit directly into this um, rotary object. In university, I studied electronics. So I just happened to find myself here. Very lucky to be here, you know. It's a very big international company, building quality cars. When the marriage is complete, they move the car back to the main line. This is where we create the face of the car. The best way is to set the light correctly in order to actually get set installed right. And then, with the bumper, you need to work with your partner. But then it works. Finally, they're ready to mount the most famous star in the automotive world. First the area is clean, and then the start is It gets pressed on with a special tool, and then attached. It's the best of the best. I cannot say it strongly enough. Seats come next. Then the doors go back on. When the door is on the car, then we are almost done. There's only one station left. The last station is where the proverbial rubber meets the road. This is the end of the cycle of assembling. Then the car is ready. This is the end of the manufacturing. It's taken over five years to go from one man's idea to a finished machine. This car, the whole AMG division, really steps out of the Mercedes-Benz shadow. It's creating its own cars. It is the big performance flagship. Now, the AMG GT is ready to take on all comers including their bitter crosstown rival. The AMG GT has a very targeted place in this segment. It lines up almost price by price with some of the best performing 911s. A base AMG GT starts at 115,000 euros, while the upgraded S model goes for over 134,000. If you're a fan of top-tier sports cars, the AMG GT is very exciting to you. The GTS launches from 0 to 100 in just 3.8 seconds. 
And when you start hustling the thing, you realize, oh my God, this car is amazingly fast. Like, they can make cars this fast? That's legal? A hand-built AMG engine propels the GTS to a top speed of 310 kilometers per hour. Straight line performance is very important, but it's all about overall package regarding a car, regarding a performance car. It has hydraulic steering. You feel everything, you know exactly what the car is doing. It is a genuinely fun supercar to drive, and not all supercars are fun. You're flinging this car through the corners, and it's leaning in there, and you're right on the edge of the tires, and it's really talking to you. It's really rewarding to drive. Creating that fun starts nearly a decade ago with the SLS. I think this car represents Mercedes' admission that perhaps its two predecessors were too expensive and too dear. The AMG GT is sort of SLS version 2.0. It's smaller, it's tighter, it handles better, it puts the power down better. It is the next evolution of that car. The most interesting thing to me about this car is looking at the progression from SLS to AMG GT. Because this car is finally what Mercedes should have been building all along. The previous SLS, it felt like the hood ended in a different state. The GT feels a lot more manageable. It is an inch shorter, and that doesn't sound like much. 25 millimeters that make a world of difference. It's more compact, it's more livable, it's more a car than a supercar, but it is 100% a dialed in performance car. Performance paired with high end German luxury. The inside of this car feels expensive, it looks expensive, and it's comfortable. I did a 1,500 mile road trip in an AMG GT. Totally comfortable, great road trip car. Doing everything right, it's comfortable. You can drive it to the office every day. True connoisseurs, true enthusiasts are really taking note of the performance potential of AMG. Every culture has an appreciation for a product and they, they, they express that very differently. The Japanese cars were expressing that attention to detail, the Italians in craftsmanship, the Germans in engineering. We don't look at that and say, wow, they're passionate engineers. But it's the same basic idea, right? They love what they do and they're passionate about it. This is finally a Mercedes-Benz supercar that can compete with the other standard supercar for everyday use, the 911. The way that Mercedes-AMG is gone about building its GT and taking the flight to the Porsche 911, I think is extremely clever. Cleverness that comes from the front midship layout. If you're gonna say the Porsche is the more precise car, the AMG is the more raucous, aggressive, muscular machine. approach the fight with the 911 the right way? Yes. Because it's not trying to beat Porsche at its game. It's doing what Mercedes and AMG have done so well for so long and really distilling it down to one car. One car that's been built with a single focus. I think the challenge for Mercedes was finally beating Porsche with this car. It's had predecessors that were wow looking, but didn't drive quite as well to go head to head with a 911. This one finally moves the mark. The Mercedes AMG GT. It wears one of the most famous hot rodding badges and is the newest sports car from the oldest automotive company in the world. It's a brand of the three-pointed stars. It is the performance and sports car brand of Mercedes-Benz. We always fulfilled what we promised, and this is maybe the reason that we have a little bit more freedom.